Good morning, everyone. It's great to see you all in the house of the Lord this morning, and we want to welcome those joining us online this morning. We're just so glad you came to join us. Uh, we do believe that God has good things in store for us. He's going to speak this morning through his word and through this worship time, and uh, hopefully we can just leave here with a deeper relationship with him. Um, as we get started this morning, can we just stand and have a word of prayer and prepare our hearts for worship? Dear Heavenly Father, God, Lord, we thank you for being here with us this morning. God, we know that you have things for us. And Lord, there are many times that we feel like maybe our prayers are falling on deaf ears or you just seem distant, but we know that's not the case. Your word tells us that you'll never leave us, you'll never forsake us. We know that you wanna give us a future and a hope, Lord. And we pray this morning that as we enter into this time of worship, all our preconceived notions, all our doubts, all our human inconsistencies, we could just lay those at the foot of the cross that we could lay them at the feet of Jesus and trust that, God, you're gonna take care of us. You're gonna take care of the circumstances and the situations in our lives that confuse us, that trouble us, that you're gonna continue to move in the areas that we find joy, that we find hope, that you're going to bring us rivers in the wastelands if necessary, Lord because your love for us is unfailing. It's deeper than anything we've ever been able to fathom. It's deeper than any love we've ever experienced in this life. God, help us to not lose sight of your love. Help us to not fall away from the truth that your word tells us that your love never fails, that while we were still sinners, you sent your only son to die on our behalf. There's no greater love than one that lays down his life for those he cares about. And you did that for us, Jesus. So as we enter into this worship time, we pray that our hearts would be open to what you're doing, to your will, to your way, to your word, and that as your word goes forth, it would resonate with our hearts and we would have just a deeper knowledge, a deeper understanding of who you are and our relationship with you would grow and prosper and flourish as we just pursue you as you've always pursued us, Jesus. We thank you, we praise you, and we ask that your will and your kingdom come here this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Oh 
seated. Let's give the Lord a hand this morning. Thank you, Jesus. Praise you, Lord. seated. Let us pray. If I can break your concentration for a second, I just want to thank you all. Uh, since last week's anointing on my back, I have not had a spasm or tenderness. 
Amen. Since then. So, thank you. I think it was C.S. Lewis that said, all is gift. And uh, it's just the movement of God, and uh, it is. It's just a gift. Let's pray to him. Lord God, we thank you. We thank you that all is gift, that your grace is, is truly just a, a measure of your goodness. That it's not our efforts, it's not our, it's not our, our, our will, our, our, our fight, our clawing that earns anything. It's simply a matter of you seeing us and working through us. So Jesus, we approach you now because we know according to your word that you see us and you hear us now, that you are sitting right now at the right hand of God interceding on our behalf. Thank you, Lord. And that vision of you being seated just screams victory and rest. So God, as we come to you, we come with a sense of boldness to even approach you, asking you to do things in our lives. God, we don't come to you asking for bigger houses and shinier cars, but instead, God, we come asking you to give us a spirit of wisdom, humbleness, trust and faithfulness that our lives would be lives that would just that would just be lives of of gentleness perseverance mercy God we thank you for the ways that you have shaped us and shaped circumstances in our lives I pray that those experiences would be well used by us. That we would do things out of them that would benefit you and your kingdom. Yeah. We thank you, Holy Spirit, that you, that you nudge us and you encourage us and you speak to us. I pray that we would stay in step with you. <laughs> God, we thank you for your healing touch physical healings as well as emotional healings. Yes, Lord. We thank you for the payment you made for us, that we are healed spiritually. So God, as we open up your word today, I ask that you, Holy Spirit, would just speak to us, that the distractions of our lives would be brushed aside, that we would be able to just focus on you and what it is that you want us to know. Again, Lord, we love you. We thank you. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. At this time, the kids are excused for Children's Church. Also at this time, I would like to introduce our guest speaker for today. Dave comes to us, and we look forward to what the Lord's laid on your heart, Dave. Please come. <laughs> Good morning. I uh, work with, uh, that kind of just blew Josh's introduction where I said, just say Dave. Anyways, uh, thank you, Josh. Um, uh, I work in the role of district superintendent for our district. I'm in my eighth year. Uh, my wife, Marcia, is with me. And uh, we live in Butler. We're in the process of relocating our district office from Punxsutawney closer to the 79 corridor. The office has been in Punxsutawney for about 70, 80 years. We're not really sure how long it's been there. So this is a pretty significant transition for us. So we enjoyed uh, the nice drive this morning as we came here. I checked 
my weather app just before I came up and it says it's still raining outside and it's gonna rain for the next hour. So kick your shoes off and relax. It's pouring down rain outside. Aren't you glad you're inside? So how has your week been? How has your week been? What happened to you? I had an unusual week. I was uh, in a place where I took somebody to uh, one of the hospitals in Wexford. Wexford is one of those northern suburbs of Pittsburgh. It's a new hospital. I think it's less than maybe two years old, a year and a half old. When we arrived at that hospital, in through the emergency room, there were four or five people that immediately took care of the need. There was no waiting, nothing, immediate care. After a brief examination, it was realized that this person needed a different type of care and that required the person to be transferred to Allegheny General in downtown Pittsburgh. So by ambulance, they took them to the downtown hospital. So when I got down there, I went in and I was sitting in the emergency room. And what a difference between sitting in the emergency room in a very upscale suburban neighborhood and sitting in an emergency room in downtown Pittsburgh. As I sat there, I sat for about four and a half hours listening to a man just moaning. And he kept asking for, can you give me some more drugs? Can you give me some more drugs? He was covered in blood. And I, I listened to the medical staff come and tell him, you have multiple fractures in your lower jaw. You have multiple fractures in your upper jaw. Something's busted in your eye socket. And he just couldn't get rid of the pain. And I just listened to him moan. There was another person to the other side of us. This was an older person that had a stroke. And so the medical staff was just almost yelling so that the person could hear them and understand what was going on. Another older woman was brought in on a stretcher. She had been in a wheelchair and she fell asleep and she fell out of the wheelchair and her head landed on a concrete floor and smashed her skull. They immediately took her to have her head scanned. Two large looking officers came through the double doors with tasers and glocks on their side. They were looking for another patient that wasn't in the area where we were. And as I sat there, I was just overwhelmed with the needs of people. And not just the needs, but the suffering of people. And then more than that, I was creating narratives in my head about what's their story. So why is the guy next to me with his jaw all busted up? What did he do? Uh, what happened to that older person? Oh, you know, when you get old. And I was, I was taken aback at my own assumptions and biases of people. But I left that place saying, what an opportunity for the church. Just a few hours in that hospital. And I remember as I exited out of sitting in the actual emergency area where they had the beds, I walked out and then I walked into the waiting area. It was packed. It was packed. 
And I thought, wow, what need right here? And then I walked out and I realized there's 50 more that are waiting. So what has the Lord been impressing on your heart from your activity this week? How has he been preparing you as you come today? Because we don't just come on Sunday with Sunday morning, do we? We bring with us all of the activities of this past week. And the Lord wants to speak with us. It is uh, just a real delight to be here. Uh, Marcia and I deeply love your pastor and his wife. In fact, during the uh, first service, he uh, texted me, and I, I want you to know that during the Sunday school hour, I've made some of those corrections that he mentioned, and hopefully it'll come out better this time. No, I'm just kidding you. I'm just kidding you. We love them deeply and we trust these days away will be very rich and rewarding for them. If you have your scriptures with you, I'd invite you to open the word of God to Luke chapter 14. If you have your gadget, feel free. I'm reading from the uh, New International Version. Luke chapter 14, let's begin at verse 15. When one of those at the table with him, with Jesus, heard this, he said to Jesus, Blessed is the man who will eat at the feast in the kingdom of God. Jesus replied, A certain man was preparing a great banquet and invited many guests. At the time of the banquet, he sent his servant to tell those who had been invited, Come for everything is now ready. But they all alike began to make excuses. The first said, I have just bought a field and I must go and see it, please excuse me. Another said, I've just bought five yoke of oxen and I'm on my way to try them out, please excuse me. Still another said, I just got married, so I can't come. The servant came back and reported this to his master. Then the owner of the house became angry and ordered his servant, go out quickly to the streets and the alleys of the town and bring in the poor, the cripple, the blind, and the lame. Sir, the servant said, what you have ordered has been done, but there is still room. Then the master told his servant, go out to the roads and the country lanes and make them come in so that my house will be full. I tell you, not one of those men who were invited will get a taste of my banquet. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we acknowledge that each of us have had quite a last week. Lord, you by your sovereign knowledge, you know what each of us are bringing with us as we come this morning. You know the experiences, the thoughts, the emotions. You know all of the experiences we have gone through. Yet Lord, in your sovereignty, you have each of us gathered here today and we sit before you. And we ask Holy Spirit that you would have your way amongst us. Open our mind, illuminate your word to us. Speak to our hearts. For Lord, our desire is to leave this place changed, different than when we came in. So Lord, we ask, would you just superintend this service for your honor and glory? In Christ's name, amen. Maybe some of you picked up the news at the beginning of January. In the small country of Brunei, there was a prince 
who was getting married. Brunei is just a small nation that's on the northern side of what used to be called the island of Borneo. Today it's called Kalimantan, most of it's part of Indonesia. But this small country, Brunei, um, had one of the sons of the Sultan who was getting married. It was an unbelievable event. The invitations went out last fall, announcing the marriage of this prince to his fiancee. And on the day of the wedding, which lasted 10 days, people came from all over the world to come to this wedding. I looked before this service, how much did this wedding cost? I couldn't find a figure because it probably is not even known. This particular country has, just to give you an example of its wealth, has a statue that looks like a waterfall that's made out of pure crystal. And it has one of the other princes on a horse with a polo mallet, which is made out of pure gold. That's just one statue. The tiara that the bride-to-be war during the ceremony was valued at $12 million. And not to count what her earrings wore and her bracelets and her necklace. It was a spectacular wedding. I actually thought, well, I'm going to try and put a few of the pictures on a slide. It doesn't do it justice. The elaborateness of this wedding banquet. And yet Jesus says the kingdom of God is like a great banquet. Isn't that fascinating? Well, before we get into that, let's look at the context by which Jesus tells this story. If you look back to the beginning of Luke, the writer records that on one Sabbath, when Jesus went to eat at the house of a prominent Pharisee. So that puts the setting for when Jesus tells the story. It's on their Jewish holy day. It's a Sabbath. And Jesus is invited to the house of a Pharisee, one of the religious elites of the day. And if you know about reading from the scriptures, the Pharisees and Jesus were often at opposite ends of the perspective of the kingdom of God. In fact, it tells us in the rest of verse 1 that Jesus was being carefully watched. So this just wasn't your ordinary invitation to somebody's house. It was kind of like, hey, come on over and we're going to get you. So was the intent of the inviter. But Luke goes on to tell us in verse 2, in front of Jesus, there just happened to be a man suffering from an illness. And Jesus asked the Pharisees and the experts of the law, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? But the scriptures tell us that they remained silent. The experts of the law asked a question by Jesus. Normally, they would have an answer. They remained silent. So since they remained silent, Jesus took hold of the man and he healed him and sent him away. He healed him on what day? On the Sabbath. So he asked those teachers, again, if one of you has a son or an ox that falls into a well on the Sabbath, remember it was the Sabbath, would you immediately pull him out? So in other words, you are going to experience great loss on the Sabbath. Will you pull him out? Because remember that the Pharisees and the teachers of the law 
they had created hundreds of laws in how to keep the Sabbath pure. Again, scripture says in verse six, they had nothing to say. Well, that doesn't really start off this lunch with the Pharisees very well, does it? But Luke goes on to say that Jesus noticed how guests picked places of honor at this luncheon that he was invited to. In fact, he told him this story, when somebody invites you to a wedding feast, don't take the place of honor for a person more distinguished than you may have been invited. And the host will come and say, hey, could you just please move out of here because there's somebody more prominent that should be sitting in this place. Back in those days, they would have feasts, they would have celebrations, and they didn't necessarily sit at a table like we would imagine with chairs around a round table. They would often have maybe low tables and they had lots of pillows and cushions and they would have rugs and carpets that they would just kind of lean back and lounge. When you were at a meal like this, you were very relaxed and it was gonna be a long time. But Jesus is saying, hey, even in that setting, there were people that were trying to get next to others who were deemed very important. Let's get next to them. Later on in the dinner, Jesus said in verse 12 to the host, hey, by the way, sir, when you give a luncheon or a dinner, don't invite your friends. Don't invite your brothers, your relatives, or your rich neighbors, for if you do, they may invite you back, and so you have been repaid. But when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the cripple, the lame, the blind, and you will be less, you will be blessed. Although they cannot repay you, you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. So this brings us up to verse 15, where it says, then one of those at the table who was with him heard this, he said, blessed is the man who will eat at the feast in the kingdom of God. The tension has risen like crazy at this Sabbath lunch that Jesus has been invited to because he hasn't been a silent guest, has he? Because when he said to the host, hey, when you invite your, when you have a lunch, don't invite just your friends, invite the poor, the blind, the cripple. Hey, that would have been easy enough to prove, just look around who's here and who's not. Jesus says, you're gonna be blessed when these people are with you. Everybody looks around and they all look like each other. None of these are here. Because this is a symbolic group. What this person in verse 15 says to kind of break the tension now that's been building, He's probably one of these guys that says, oh, I hate it when things just get so uptight at these meals. He says real quick, hey, blessed is the person who will get the feast at the great banquet of God. He's referring to a text. He's referring back to a prophecy from Isaiah to when Isaiah says there will come a day, there will come a time when God will host this great banquet and the peoples of the nations will be there. And he says, we'll celebrate. And so he raises this question, assuming that Jesus will simply reply, yes, if we can be good people, if we can obey the law, if we can be pure in our ways, God will be delighted to have us sitting around that table at the great day. 
But that's not what Jesus said, was it? Jesus goes in to tell the story about a man who hosted a great banquet. Now, something interesting has happened because in what Jesus says, even in his story, he talks about the poor, the cripple, the lame. And he tells the host, listen, don't just invite your friends, but invite the poor, the lame, and the cripple. So what's happening? Well, it's interesting that soon after Isaiah gave this prophecy of this wonderful picture of this banquet that will happen in the end times of peoples that worship the Messiah, that worship God through his son will happen. That time until this moment with Jesus, there's been about 700 years that have passed. Interestingly, over those years, they have discovered, historians have discovered different translations of Isaiah's dream, of his vision. There were different, different Jewish groups that produced different writings and listen to what they said. There was this one translation which was called the Targum. The Targum was a special um, type of writing because after the Hebrews went into exile, um, they came back out and there was different languages being spoken. And so the scriptures, uh, the Hebrew scriptures would often have translations or explanations given to them. And hence the purpose of the translation of the Targum. And when they were dealing with the prophecy of Isaiah, they said, oh yes, there will be others there, particularly the non-Jews or the Gentiles. But they will be able to come to this banquet but they will suppose it as an honor, but it will be a shame to them because great plagues will happen and they'll be unable to escape. In fact, God tricks them to come to this banquet only to kill them. Wow. About the second century BC, researchers, researchers found a document which was called the Book of Enoch. And this book speaks of the great banquet of the Messiah and also affirms that the Gentiles will be there, that the non-Jewish people will be there. However, though, it says at this banquet, the angel of death will be present and will use his sword to destroy all the Gentiles. In fact, in the book of Enoch, it says the banquet hall will run with blood. There is another source which came out of the Qumran community. Maybe you've heard that. The Qumran community was where they found the Dead Sea Scrolls. And they also talked about this messianic Rule this banquet that was going to happen. But in the Qumran community, they said, most likely not even all the Jews are going to be at this, but just the pious, the righteous. But who will clearly not be there will be those that have physical ailments, those that are lame, those that are crippled, those that cannot see. So you can see that over these hundreds of years from when Isaiah said, there will be a day when God will host a banquet and there'll be people from all nations, Jews and non-Jews alike, and they will gather and there'll be a great celebration. That had been completely rejected by the time Jesus is in the home of the Pharisees. 
So when Jesus says, hey, when you have a banquet, don't just invite your friends, but invite those that don't fit in. He was speaking to something very, very personal and prevalent within the lives of the Jewish teachers and elite. So that's the context of how much has shifted and Jesus now comes on the scene. If you notice, let's go to the next slide. In Luke 4, I just want to draw your attention to a passage here because it's critical to put in the context of what's happening. You remember in Luke 4 that um, Jesus returns to Galilee. The scriptures say he taught in, his, in the synagogues and everybody praised him. And it says, when he went up to Nazareth where he had been brought up, and on the Sabbath day, he went to the synagogue, which was his custom, and he stood up to read. The scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Remember, the, the, the prophecies of Isaiah were very meaningful to the Jewish people. So unrolling it, he found the place where it was written, the spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners, recovery of sight to the blind, to release the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. He rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant and sat down. Notice what Luke says, the eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened upon him. And he said, today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. He is not talking about a Messiah that is to come. He says, today, what I've just read, I am the fulfillment of the prophecies of Isaiah. Jesus ensued the kingdom of God when he came. And so here we are now in Luke chapter 14. Jesus is in this house. The tension is elevated. And the question is, blessed is the person that's going to sit at the banquet. Ah, those deserving good people that will be there. And then Jesus tells the story. A certain man preparing a great banquet invited many guests. And at the time of the banquet, he sent his servant and he said, now everything is prepared. Come, come. Now is the time. Come. Marcia and I moved to our new home last August. And uh, we were the newest people in this community. And we thought, well, let's get to know some of our neighbors and let's speed up the process a little bit. Let's host a get to know the Dave and Marcia party. So Marcia made invitations. She went out to 18 houses in our neighborhood and she gave them an invitation. And she said, on this day, we're going to have a party. Would you come? And so many of those she met, they said, sure, we'll be there. Yes, we'll come. See, you always get two invitations, don't you? You get to save the date, but then, then comes the date. And Marcia worked hard all that day. She cleared everything up. The house was vacuumed. We cleared everything off the dining table. We put as long as we could make it. And that dining table was full. There were cut meats. There were cut cheeses. There was fruit. There were breads. There was all sorts of things prepared. And I remember walking in there and I said, wow, it's beautiful. Look at everything at the table. And then I looked at my watch. 
I said, well, will anybody come? And I thought to myself, what a waste if nobody comes. And so we waited. And before long, ding dong, somebody came to the front door. A couple minutes later, knock, 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 somebody came to the door. A few minutes later, another group of five couples came to the door. It wasn't long and the house was full. Jesus tells the story that the invitation went out for this banquet. And there were those that said, yes, we'll be there. But when it came time for the banquet, Jesus says, there were those that began to make excuses. In fact, in verse 18, it says, they all alike began to make excuses. One said, I've bought a field and I've got to go check it out after I've bought it. Please excuse me. Another said, well, I've just bought five yoke of oxen. I've, I've got to go check these auction these oxen out before any more time goes by, even though I've bought them. Third said, hey, I've got, just got married. I can't come. He doesn't even ask to be excused. You would think somebody that just got married would say, I can't wait to come to the, the party. I want to show my new bride off. I want you to meet my bride. He doesn't even say, excuse me. He just says, I'm not coming. It really, at the end of the day of what Jesus is saying, it doesn't matter what was told because they were excuses. Anybody in that context would have said, nobody buys a field without looking at it. Nobody goes buys an animal until you know if it's healthy. They were meaningless excuses and the intent was simply to embarrass the host, to make the host look bad. <laughs> Nobody's coming. Nobody's coming. If we notice here, verse 21 of chapter 14, this is the pivot of the story Jesus is telling. The servant came back and reported this to his master. He came back and said, hey, all those that were given invitations, all those that said they were coming, when it came time, they said no. That would be like if you threw a party and somebody said, nah, I, I got to cut the grass. Uh, no, I've got to, I've got to go wash my dog. It wouldn't even be an excuse, would it? It'd be an offense to you as a host. Then the owner of the house in verse 21 became angry and ordered his servant go out quickly into the streets and the alleys of the town and bring in the poor, the cripple, the blind, and the lame. Do you see the owner of the house, the host of the party had every right for vengeance. He had every right for revenge to those who tried to humiliate him. But that anger was turned into grace. And he said, okay, go out, go into town and find those that wherever they're at, invite them. And who does he say? But specifically the poor, the cripple, the blind and the lame. Yes, it could represent those with physical ailments, but what it's speaking to are those within the pharisaical mind, within the religious elite mind that said, these are the outcasts. These are those that live on the margin. These are the ones that are not worthy. 
And Jesus says, bring them in, bring them in. Can you imagine the opportunity? I've never been invited. I can't believe this. He's asking me to come. Jesus goes on in the story that he's telling. And he says, sir, the servant said, what you have ordered has been done. Listen now what he's saying. What you have ordered has been done, but there's still room. Then the master told his servant, go out to the roads and the country lanes and make them come in so that my house will be full. What the master in the story that Jesus is telling says now, he says, go to the roads and the country lanes. In their day, the hearers would have understood that as go to those that are beyond your community. Go to those that are not like you, that don't look like you, talk like you, act like you. Very clearly, they would not have missed that Jesus said, go to the Gentiles. What's the motive in the story that Jesus is telling? Why does the master tell his servant to do this? And here's the motive. So that my house may be full. Our greatest delight after all the preparation that Marcia had done for our party, our greatest delight was when there was no room to move in our house. There were so many people. There were so many people. Look around. Is there room? Is there room? Jesus says, go, go, have them come. Yes, we've done that then go beyond. And there's this interesting word that Jesus puts in on the second command to go out. He says, make them come in. It actually is a word is compel them to come. Because why? If you received an invitation to go to the wedding of the son of the Sultan of Brunei, you would say, whoa, <laughs> this is delivered to the wrong address. This isn't for me. I mean, I don't have a Gucci purse. I don't have a Armani suit to wear. I don't have an appropriate gift to bring. I'm sure those that came brought gold as a gift. But Jesus says, the kingdom of God is like a banquet. It's a wonderful place. There's food and drink and we lean back and we relax and we laugh and we enjoy each other. He said, now go out and compel people to come. Because just like in Jesus day, there were those, you remember the woman at the well? She came in noonday because she didn't want to come when the other women came. And when it was disclosed to her that Jesus knew that she'd been married many times and the man she was living with wasn't her husband, something happened to her. She said, he knows all about me and yet he still loves me. I'm fully known and fully accepted. And so she goes and back into town and tells people to come. You gotta meet this guy. 
You see, Jesus says, go out and compel them to come. Because people, because of their choices, because of their lifestyle, because of how things have gone for them, they will say, I'm not worthy. They will say, I will never be accepted. And Jesus says, you know what? Go out and compel them. Take them by the arm gently and, and say, come on, come with me. When you come, you're gonna find a welcome. You're gonna find a welcome. A lot of us wrestle with that, don't we? Maybe some of you say, hey, you know what? I know some people that this is not a normal experience for them coming to church, but I really wonder if I invited them, would they really be welcomed? Or would people notice how they're dressed? Would they notice how they smell? I've got a friend, every time I've talked to him, he's had liquor on his breath. Doesn't matter the time of day. If I, I want to bring my friend, but would, would they find a welcome? Maybe there's some of you that question that. Let's be the kind of body that says yes. We're gonna compel people to come. Maybe there's some of you that say, I don't have those kind of relationships. And then I think about the time where I sat just a couple of days ago in that emergency room and said, there are people all around me. Jesus said, the kingdom of God is like a banquet, a great banquet. And you get into the banquet because your name is on the invitation. That's how you get into the banquet. Jesus said, he's not willing that any should perish. He said, I am the good shepherd. Though the, the road is narrow, those that gain entrance into heaven come through me. It's salvation, it's personal faith in Jesus Christ. But Jesus is making the point through his story that all has changed with the coming of Jesus Christ. May it be. May it be. Your entrance into the kingdom is because your name is on the invitation. If you don't go in to the banquet, it's because you said no. And the story that Jesus tells says that there will be those that chose not to, but the banquet still goes on. And there will be those that say no, but others will take their place. Because the father wants his house full. This is a very sobering story that Jesus tells, isn't it? You notice at the end of this story, Jesus says, hey, go out into the, the lanes and, and the alleys of town and bring in the poor and the cripple. And the servant says, what you ordered has been done. Then the master says, go out in the roads and the country lanes and compel them to come in. But there's no response there, is there? That's ongoing. That hasn't been completed. Praise the Lord. That's the opportunity for you and I. But here is that sober statement. I tell you, 
Not one of those men who were invited will get a taste of my banquet. It's very possible. It's very possible that in this context, Jesus is talking to the religious leaders. They have had the words of Isaiah for 700 years. But over time, that beautiful vision of Isaiah of all peoples that will be at the banquet, it actually got narrowed down to just a few elite, special, pure, good people. There's something about over time, something can happen to those that love Jesus. And he calls us afresh today. My love is so great. My kingdom is so great. And it's so wonderful. It's like a banquet. And you're invited to the banquet. Two responses. Yes or no. It makes sense then to some of these scriptures when they say, Lord, Lord, and he said, wait a second, depart from me, I, I don't know you. And we read in the scriptures where they're knocking on the door and yet the door isn't open. And he says, go from here. The invitation isn't forever, is it? The scripture said, today is the day of salvation. So as you have come today, you bring all the activity of last week with you. As you leave today, what will God do? Because you will be carrying invitations. You and I have the privilege to go out and say, come on, you're invited. You're invited you're gonna find a welcome. You're gonna find a place. You're gonna meet the host and he loves you. Let's pray. Jesus, you've helped us today to wade through very challenging passages of scripture. And we confess that our hearts and our emotions might be going in many different directions. So Lord, we pray afresh, come Holy Spirit. Lord, those of us that know Jesus Christ, we are humbled that our name was on that invite list. Lord, if there is somebody here today which maybe their thought is, hey, I, I'll go to the banquet. I'm just not going right now. Lord, would you prompt that person to say, no, today is the day of salvation. And Lord, fill our hearts with joy as we have the opportunity to go out in the byways and the streets of our community and our neighboring towns and to tell people about Jesus and to, as your word says, compel them to come. Lord, we bless you and we thank you Lord, speak clearly to each of us, even right now, we ask. Amen. Would you stand with us this morning?
a second. <laughs> you took one of my papers. <laughs> Let's worship God now. <laughs> Jesus said, the kingdom of God is like a banquet. Could I just give you this imagery as you go? When you sit at a table, it's the kingdom of God. 
When you gather with somebody for a coffee or a tea, it's the kingdom of God. When you are in the lunchroom at the mill or at the high school, it's the kingdom of God. I don't think it's happenstance that Jesus tells this story when he's at somebody's house for a meal. And he says, that's really what the kingdom of God is like. It's a great meal. As we go from here, maybe this week, there'll be somebody who said, hey, let's get a coffee. Would you come to our house for dinner? Could we bring something to your house? Let's eat together. Let the kingdom of God be expanded. Amen? Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, thank you for your word. We ask, oh God, that we are not simply hearers, but doers of your word. So Lord, fill us afresh with your Holy Spirit. Remove fear. Satan wants to go after what makes us afraid, what people think. Lord, just remove that from us. Yes. Lord, because the kingdom is like a banquet. And Lord, there's so much joy and laughter and celebration. So, Lord, with that spirit of joy, send us from this place. And, Lord, empower us by your spirit and divine love to compel those to join the meal. In Jesus' name, amen. You are May you have a wonderful day and a wonderful week. Cheers.